You ever feel like, uh, what in the world is going on? Um, I, uh, my bow hunting season has felt that way this year. I've missed several times, which is strange for me. Um, just, just totally missed the deer. And I've left, found myself, and that, that's happened three times. I found myself going, what, it, what is going on? I, I still haven't quite figured it out, but I, I often ask myself that when I watch the news. <laughs> Like, what is going on in the world? Um, and that statement sort of reflects that we feel, we feel confused and we desire some clarity around um, um, a particular uh, thing that is happening, especially in the world, when we look at the world. And that's why I love God's Word so much, is that it brings me clarity. I love, it to, te- I love to teach it to you guys. Um, I love it when I feel like um, the Lord has used me to bring some clarity to you as I've taught the Word. And the thing that I love most about that is when I'm studying and preparing to teach you, it brings so much clarity to me. And over the years, um, you know, for I guess 30 years now, I've been teaching the Bible, and I just continue to gain more and more clarity every time I teach through a a different book of the Bible. And um, I believe in Romans 11, uh, that uh, specific clarity comes to this question of what in the world is going on. We look at the world and we ask, like, what is happening? And Romans 11 speaks a lot into that, and it gives us some insight into what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do in the world. So God has done some things already. He's actively doing some things, and in the future, he will even do some greater things as we head toward this uh, climactic event of the return of Christ. And so uh, it's good to have some insight for living, what, what we are a part of. Now, in Romans, you have uh, chapters 1 through 11, and they are just heavy in theology. In like, this is, this is the gospel. This is what's wrong with the world. Um, this is what justification is and how God does a work in a human being's life and makes them right with him. So they're in a a good standing with the Lord and they're um, justified in him. And they're no longer enemies of God, but they are friends with God because they've been reconciled to him. And so we go through all of this uh, incredible theology. We get to um, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and Paul begins to deal specifically with the nation of Israel. Um, And so he's talking about that nation. We've been exploring that the past couple of weeks. And in chapter 11, um, he, he sort of sums that up a bit. And then he breaks off into this, um, this hymn of praise. And we get to chapter 12 and through the end of the book, and it gets, it gets very practical and starts to deal with, okay, this is how the rubber meets the road. This is how all of this theology that I've taught you up to this point, how it plays out in your life, and he gives us, gives us some guides for how this should play out in my individual life, in your life, and how we should be living as followers of Jesus. And so we're going to finish up in chapter 11, and then we'll begin, um, you know, in the new year, following Christmas, we'll start to look at uh, some of this practical stuff. But uh, today is pretty interesting, and I hope you'll give me some grace as I... Uh, jump into some pretty heavy stuff, and that I, my, my prayer is that I don't confuse you, especially after I said it brings clarity. <laughs> it says, I ask then, um, did God reject his people? And so Paul is starting with the question of, well, there were some promises that came to the nation of Israel in the old covenant that came to Abraham, and now God is turning his attention, and according to everything that has been taught to us in this book so far, he's turning his attention to the Gentile world, um, and did he, did he reject his people? And Paul says, by no means, I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? 
I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. So Paul begins with, has God rejected his people, Israel? And the answer he gives is is no, God has not rejected them. God keeps his promises. And so God has made promises in the Bible. That's what makes the Bible such an incredible book. And we can see the hand of God in it. He said God has made promises and God has fulfilled those promises. And so you could study prophecy in the Bible and it can bolster your faith in such an incredible way as you see how God would prophesy something through a prophet And then hundreds of years after that prophet's death, it would actually come to pass. And there are many prophecies that have already been fulfilled. There are prophecies about um, the Messiah that have been fulfilled, that he would be uh, born of a virgin, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that just all kinds of things about what his name would be, what he would do. And, And Jesus, one of the incredible things about Jesus is that he fulfilled all those prophecies. And the odds of of a person being able to do that is just absolutely incredible. If you do any um, uh, work uh, or st- research in that, it's, it'll blow you away about how um, what the odds of one human being being able to fulfill just a handful of the prophecies um, that Jesus fulfilled were, and, and, and yet he does all of them. And, and so God keeps his promises, and he's bound by himself. Let, let, ev- let God is faithful, I think the word says, and let every man be a liar. And so when we look at the word, man, and we study the word, and we see the promises of God, we can be encouraged by the fact that, man, the things that God has promised, he will fulfill. And so the people of Israel, he had made these promises to them nationally. And so these, when, when God is uh, talking through the word here and Paul is writing about this, is, has God rejected Israel? He's not speaking of an individual person here. He's, he's speaking of the nation itself because um, no longer um, are they receiving the promises of God. But God says that there is always a remnant. There always has been and there always will be. You remember a couple of weeks ago, we taught, I taught you where Paul said, not all Israel is Israel. Not everybody who is in Israel is actually a part of Israel. And Paul is saying, though, I am a Jew and God has not rejected me. And he's basically saying, first of all, I'm proof. I'm, I'm even from the least tribe uh, of Benjamin and God has not rejected me. All of the first Christians were Jews. Um, we know that the apostles that were selected by Jesus were Jews. They were a part of the nation of Israel. We know that um, when the day of Pentecost happened, it came first um, to the Jews, and the church started there in Jerusalem. And, and in time, then it spread out to the Gentile world. And, and as the Jews continued to reject Jesus as Messiah, then the gospel was opened up, and in even greater capacity to the Gentiles. And then Paul even refers to himself as an apostle, as one who is untimely born, who was set aside specifically for the mission of taking the gospel, the good news of the covenant of God, the new covenant to the Gentile world. And then he refers to Elijah. And he said, as further proof, he says, remember the story of Elijah. Elijah was Man, he was a prophet that was used of God and, and was able to do incredible things. And he's preaching and teaching about the word of God that is being revealed to him. And there's a, there's like pagan worship going on of this, um, false God known as Baal. And it's going on in the nation of Israel. And they have turned away from the things that they had received during the time of Moses. And this, um, woman by the name of Jezebel, um, who is in leadership is really responsible for leading the people into this national sin. 
And Elijah, man, he is, he's been combating that and he feels all alone and he finds himself on the run and he's in a cave and hiding and he feels so alone. And he says, I'm the only one left. There are no others. And God speaks to him. And you can study this um, in, in the story about Elijah. And, and God says to him, no, no, you're not alone, bro. He says, I've reserved 7,000 prophets for myself. There's 7,000 out there. You may not know about them, Elijah, but they're out there. And it is God reinforcing that there is a remnant. You're never alone. And I would say to you that sometimes you may feel like, as a follower of Jesus, that you feel like you're alone at work. You're the only believer. You may feel like in your neighborhood, you're the only believer. You may feel like at school, you're, you're the only believer. But the fact of the matter is you're never alone. There is always a remnant. And God tells Elijah, he asks him, what are you doing here, man? Get out of this place. Like, you don't need to be hiding. Get out there. I've got your back. And so sometimes when we start to feel like we're alone and we're not paying attention to the remnant that is around us, then we can go into hiding and not be actively engaged in the purpose that God has called each one of us to. There are always people around that are pursuing the heart of God. And I would even go as far to say, and I'll get into this, I think, here a little bit as as we dive deeper, I think there's a remnant within the church. Um, that, that everybody who is a part of the church is not actually a part of the church. They may be a part of the church as an organization, but they're not part of the church as the body of Christ. And so in this text, or in this context that we're referring to, that, that there's always a remnant, there are always a group of God's people who actually um, believe, and it was based on belief. And he says that's the difference, is the remnant is always based on belief, and those who are not a part of my um, kingdom, even within Israel, even though I've made a covenant to them, those who are not part are trying to work their way in. The others are believing their way in, and the belief is shaping their behavior, and they're not trying to perform in their behavior to please God. They recognize they are pleasing to God based solely on what God has said, and they trust in God, and because of God's promise to them and the, the, their claiming of the promise, it begins to shape all of their behavior. And so right now, um, Israel is under the curse of God as a nation. We look at Israel today, they are under the curse of God as a nation. Why? Well, now, when I say the curse of God, God is not fulfilling the promises to them. He's pro- fulfilling the promise to the remnant. And they are under the curse. Why? Because they have rejected the Messiah, Jesus. And, and so when we look at Israel, what is intended to bless them is actually breaking them. It says that... Um, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. So God lays out a table of blessing. I'm reminded of the uh, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord prepares a table before me. It's a promise to the Jewish people. That table is a table of fellowship. Eating was so important, and they would have all these feasts, and these feasts would remind them of the promises of God and how they were connected to God. That table um, that was intended to be a blessing has become a curse, and their backs are bent because now they're trying to do to please God, those who are not part of the remnant, instead of believe that they are already pleasing to God. And so righteousness doesn't come to them because they're trying to earn righteousness. They're trying to be righteous instead of recognizing that the only way one can become righteous is if God makes you righteous. And how does God make us righteous? We believe. We believe in what he has said. And for those of us in the um, new covenant uh, that has been given to us by Christ, that's why he instituted the Lord's Supper as an indication of the new covenant, is that we believe by grace through faith we have been saved, and we believe in that, and that puts us within the kingdom of Christ. And so right now, Israel, although everything that God had promised was intended to be a blessing to them, it has become a burden. When Abby and I were married, um, we went on, on a cruise in our, for our honeymoon, and uh, 
So we had never been on a cruise, this young couple hadn't hardly been out of Oklahoma. And here we are on this ship, and um, they, they seat you with people on a cruise. And it just so happens that here I am, you know, a, a, a young preacher boy. They set us with a Jewish couple from New York, I think, or New Jersey. And so the wife was a very devout um, Jew. The husband, I would say, not so much. Um, he, he wore uh, his, what do you call that thing? Yeah, whatever y'all said. I can't hear you. But that's what you call it. <laughs> and, and, and so he did wear that, but he ate all the food that we ate. And she did not. She literally had like a TV dinner brought every night. Okay, and, and, and it would be in, she would have to unwrap the cellophane. It had its own. It was a kosher meal. And so they, that's what she had to settle for. And I, I was in conversation with them. And I remember very distinctly saying to her at the table, um, you know, wait, like, it must be such an incredible feeling to be one of God's chosen people. And she said, yeah, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> she looked at her meal, and the table that was intended to be a blessing was a burden for her. I mean, she was just talking about it, like, no, it's hard to carry this around, man. And, and so that's, that, that's kind of what Paul is saying here is everything that God had promised because of their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. When it says God gave them a heart of stupor, it doesn't mean that God just come down. He's like, well, I'm just going to make their hearts hard. No, they rejected all of the truth that was revealed to them. And we learned that when a person does that in the beginning of Romans, that, that God gives a person over to their desire, that depraved mind and their thinking becomes... Um, like, like just, um, it becomes something other than the truth or not dwelling on the truth. And so that just continues to create a harder and harder heart as they are not, um, responding to all of the truth that God is revealing to them. So what was intended to bless them is actually breaking them. Why is it doing that? It's because of belief. Now, here's the thing is the more that one feeds on falsehood, the more immune they are to truth. That's why we end up with different cults. That's why we end up with um, uh, even all kinds of different, there, there are some things within our world right now in our culture, they look very Christian, but they're not. And what separates them from being a, an actual Christian is how they're developing um, and being taught things that are not true according to the word. That's why the word becomes central, man, in a church. You want to be a part of a church where the church, the, the body of believers and the pastor and the teachers um, that are they're a part of the, the, the staff there, the ministers of the gospel, they're teaching the word. They're not teaching you from some other book. They're not teaching you from culture and how culture is shaping you. Them, they're teaching you from the word. This is what God has preserved for us in his word. This is what he said. Because if you start to teach um, something that is untrue, then you begin to get immune to the truth and you start believing a lie. And we know that the enemy, the, Jesus said that the, the devil is a father of lies. That is his native language. And he loves to function in that. And when, when a person or a group of people get caught up in falsehood, they become immune to truth. And so the first takeaway that I have for you out of this first section of scripture is the blessing and the curse of God are based on belief. It's what we believe that is going to bring about either the blessing of God in our lives or the curse of God. Now, what is the curse of God? The curse of God is just when God is turning away and he's not blessing your life. And you say, well, why would God do that? Because you're believing a lie instead of the truth that he has revealed to you in his word that he has preserved for thousands of years through this one people group that he chose for himself. And even to those people, see, we often say, I said this last week, and I think it's, it's very um, powerful uh, for us to understand as we go, well, you mean all these other religions are wrong? Yes. Yes, anything that is not based upon what God has revealed, I would say is wrong because God is saying to his own people whom he's revealed the truth that are believing the wrong things about what he's revealed are saying they are not part of my kingdom. 
And so like even the, they believe in the same God, um, but their, 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 their worship of him and how they're trying to be in relationship with him is all messed up. It's based on their human power instead of the divine hand of God. And so the remnant is based on belief, not works. That's what this passage says. If it were based on works, it would no longer be grace. It's based on grace. And we look at what, what, what do we know about Abraham? Abraham, what? He believed, and it was credited to him as what? Righteousness. And that's why he is the father of our faith, and we are the seed of Abraham, is because Abraham, what was so special about Abraham was not his obedience and all that he did, it was his belief. And that's why he began to obey, is he believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So the blessing of God falling on us is based on what we believe. And so well, that begs the question, well, is Israel lost forever? Here they are. I mean, we see that they've been preserved. Certainly they uh, are a nation that there's so many incredible things, and I, this is not a, a message about the end times, though some of it applies um, uh, to, uh, to that. But th- there, are, there are just so many incredible things about the nation of Israel. Uh, and it, uh, to me, it's incredible that this little bitty tiny country, one, they were scattered all over the world, didn't have a land, but they still retained their identity over all these years. And I think it was in 1948, they, re- they moved back to their homeland. And so they're there now, and, and they're like this little bitty um, people group is still like in the central part of the, of the news every day. You can't even hardly turn the news on and not hear something about Israel. And that's fascinating to me, and that encourages me, but I say, you, know, you see the hand of God all over this uh, nation. It, it is a people that he's chosen, and it, it is a work that he will continue to do, and there is a remnant that is a part of Israel that is a part of the church uh, today. But our, is the nation itself lost forever? Well, Paul says, again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I'm talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, that's us, unless you're Jewish, you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. I used to always think that was Jesus, but that's not referring to Jesus. That's referring to Abraham. Abraham is the root of the Jewish people. What was the root about Abraham is that he believed in God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so now as we believe, as he believed, then that righteousness also comes to this. And he says, he goes on to say, you will say then branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Now, this is important to note right here. Let me pause. God, like right now, this word that is, Paul is writing, that the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to write, um, he's, he's speaking to to groups of people to the, about the nation of Israel and about the, the Gentiles, or I would say even go further, the church uh, at this point. So he's speaking uh, in generalities, not individuals. So he says, and he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, 
provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So uh, in horticulture, this is not the way you do it. You don't, you don't go and get a branch off a wild olive tree and put it on a good tree. You take a branch off of the good olive tree and put it on the wild olive tree. So it's unnatural, even in horticulture, this illustration is a little bit backwards, but that's what God is saying is that there is a supernatural thing going on here. It is a a spiritual birth that happens and it's reaching out to the Gentile a world and grafting them in to the nation of Israel, the, the covenant that the nation of Israel had. And it is how God is beginning to move um, in the world as he's in the new covenant that was instituted by Christ. Has Israel fallen beyond recovery? Not at all, Paul says. No way. He says their rejection has made possible our protection. And so And that is designed in order to provoke them to a point of jealousy. Paul always went, when he went into a new town, a new city, he always went to the Jewish synagogue first, and he would preach the gospel to them. And then when they would reject it, he would shake off the dust of his feet, and he would go immediately and start ministering to the Gentiles. And he did this over and over. Um, And so the Lord, what we see here, is brought good from evil by creating his church. And I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8, that all things work to the good uh, of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So we look at the bad, Israel has rejected the plan of God, the Messiah of God, but out of that rejection, God has preserved a remnant within the nation of Israel, which means he keeps his promises to his people that he made to Abraham and David and all throughout all of the, the generations of the Israelite people. He's keeping the promises, but as part of that promise, what was it? Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed through you. So now the rejection is being used to bring about the inclusion of all of the nations of the world to be grafted into the promise that was given to Abraham that righteousness is credited to people who believe in what God has said. And so their rejection has made possible our inclusion. And the Lord has brought this about by creating his uh, church and all the nations of the world are blessed because of that. So right now, the church, the body of Christ, which includes the remnant of Israel, walks under the blessing of God. And so Israel is included in the church if they're a part of the new covenant. If they've rejected as Jesus, Jesus as Messiah, they're not. And so this is how God is fulfilling the original promise to Abraham. And here's your second takeaway. Consider the kindness and the sternness of God. Now, in our modern day churches, we like to think about the kindness of God, but we don't like to think about the sternness of God. But Paul says you need to consider both. And here's what, again, I'll throw this out there. I believe that it's happening. It seems to me that God always, he started with the physical, a physical promise, a physical people. It brought about a spiritual promise, a spiritual people, their spiritual redemption, and we're headed back to another physical reality when Jesus returns and the physical uh, resurrected body that he has and the dead in Christ shall rise and we are ushered into uh, the future kingdom of Christ. And so we're, we're returning back to that physical place. And I believe that what is going to happen when he's talking about, um, d- you know, don't be arrogant, consider that it is belief that a person, a, a nation was cut off. And I think he's referring to the church here. And I believe that the, 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 the church will become apostate in the future. And so there will be, there will be always be a remnant, but there will be churches that will become apostate because of their unbelief. Their unbelief in what? Their unbelief in the word of God. I believe that there are churches uh, like right now, very close to us that are 
either apostate or very close. Now, are there people that may go to those churches that maybe they're not apostate? Maybe they're part of the remnant? Probably so, but they need to be paying attention to what is going on. And as we progress closer and closer to the time of Christ, there will be a church that uh, exists, I think, that even somehow has some affinity to Christ, but it doesn't look like anything like the gospel, and it will be an apostate church. You say, well, how do I know if it's an apostate church? It is the church that is teaching the word of God and is true to the word of God is how you know if they're teaching the word of God and they're letting the word of God um, drive their um, drive their mission and, and, and transformation is happening because people are believing the word of God that, and they're not trying to change the word of God, then you know they're true to what God has originally called us to. And so as we move toward um, uh, the return of Christ, there are, there, there are only two possibilities. And they are this, is that there will be an awakening among the church um, and there will be a revival that happens among believers. Uh, and I don't mean like a, a small movement. I mean an awakening. Like you can read about there's, there's been some great awakenings in history and it sweeps across the world. It touches the entire church and things happen like we've never seen before. And so we will either have that or we will move toward a, a, a stronger and more powerful apostate church, which means that it will become more and more difficult for you and I as believers to live out our faith in a world that doesn't like us. And that's kind of like, that's, we, we, those are the options, right? Or, and, and, and if that's the case, we're moving that way, then Christ will return uh, and, and uh, uh, spare us from a lot of things, but there are some things we will have to endure. So the second takeaway is consider the kindness and the sternness of God. Now let's let's finish um, um, the the bulk of our text. I'll give you one more takeaway and make some comments. Are y'all confused yet? Huh? Okay, you need to go downstairs to kids' church. <laughs> Don't get it. Done. <laughs> All right. So he says, "I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, Tom." <laughs> no, he says, uh, so brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in, okay? So there's a time when the full number of the Gentiles comes in. And in this way, all Israel be, will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant um, with them when I take away their sins, as far as the gospel is concerned. They are enemies for your sake, but as far as election is concerned, they are um, loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so too... They have become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. What does that mean, that last statement? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody is bound over to that disobedience. But mercy is extended to a certain group of people as they believe in that mercy of God and the gospel of Christ. Then we see the mercy of God coming in. But those who reject it, not so much. And so a mystery, he says, he says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery. A mystery in the Bible comes from the Greek word mysterion, and it means, it doesn't mean a mystery like we're trying to figure something out. It means that something that has been hidden in the past is now being revealed to us through the word. And so when the fullness of the Gentiles comes, what that means is when God has finished, like, saving his church, his body. When he is finished with that, then Israel will repent. And God will use the mercy that has been extended to the church to awaken Israel. 
This is pretty exciting. It's like there will come a time where Israel will continue to look and see how the church is reaping the blessing of God. Now, that includes Jewish people who are part of the remnant, but it doesn't include the nation as a whole. And at one some point in the future, this, <coughs> this mercy will extend um, from uh, beyond the church, and, and it, or this mercy that is extended to the church will awaken Israel, and she will repent and mourn over her rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. It's all part of God's plan. Sovereignly, he talks about it all through the pages of Scripture. And the more you study about it, you go, okay, this is what in the world is going on, is God is working out his plan of salvation to all the peoples of the world that started through this promise of this one man that came through this nation, and right now they're walking in rejection of him, but in the future there will be a revival among them. And, and, and so what are we to do in the midst of that? We are to celebrate his mercy. That's what Paul is saying to us. That's the last takeaways. Man, we need to be people who are just celebrating the mercy of God that has fallen on our lives because even as we celebrate that mercy, at some point as the church becomes more and more effective at celebrating the mercy of God, God will use that celebration to provoke the nation of Israel to a place of jealousy where they repent and they come back home to him and they receive Christ as their Messiah. And then Paul... um, he says, this is, this, is, this is what he teaches us um, on how we, before he breaks out in verses 12 through uh, 16, or chapters 12 through 16, on how we should live. But he breaks out, like, this is so cool. He breaks out in this spontaneous praise um, with this, this doxology. And, and what he's doing is, as you can like, and, and this doesn't need a whole lot of comment. I'm going to read it. But what Paul is doing is, is man, he's been writing this stuff. And the Lord is speaking to him. The Lord has opened up heaven. I mean, he's writing about stuff. You could not, like, you could not make a story like this up. Like this story is absolutely incredible what, what, what God is preserving. And so he uses men to preserve it over thousands of years. And the apostle Paul is, is used, like he doesn't deserve this. Like he was a, he was violently persecuting the people who received Jesus as Messiah. But, but, but Christ shows up and he appears to him in his resurrected form. And he calls him and says, I'm going to use you as an apostle, as, as an instrument, a specific instrument. And you're going to take the message of the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and so Paul is like, he's trying to walk that out. And here he is, and he's writing Romans and he's writing through chapter one and about how mankind and culture devolves into this place of, of mental uh, delusion and they don't have reason and how it leads and plays out um, to the ultimate perversion of sexual sin. And then he talks about justification and how all have sinned and fallen short of this glory of God and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, some of the most incredible stuff of Christianity. And he's just pinning it, man. He's writing it and the Holy Spirit is like pouring it through him. And when he gets to this part, he just says, oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And it's just a beautiful passage of... (laughs) Like Paul is basically saying in that statement, I, I, I can't believe what I've just written. It's, it's that good. It is from the hand of God. And he's, he's just proclaiming like, who could have known this? I could have never have known this. God has shown me this. God has revealed this to me. And Paul, boy, he talks about how he was, I mean, he talks about things, different experiences that he had. He's like, wouldn't even speak of himself in the first person. He said, man, I know a man who was caught up to the third heaven, third heavens and God, uh, and it was revealed to him things that are uh, uh, not even permissible to speak about. But Paul is just like, man, the Lord has just poured things out in Paul. And thank the Lord he did because we understand so much about our faith because of him. And, And so such a beautiful passage that needs no explanation and brings us to the big idea. And that is give glory to God. 
Like, what do you do with your life? You give glory to God. You live your life and you understand it is not about me receiving glory. It's not about me receiving glory and walking in some self-righteous way and becoming legalistic and proclaiming to others that I am righteous because of what I do. No, it's recognizing that I could never gain righteousness, that it has been imparted to me based upon what Jesus has done. And I believe that and I walk in that. And so I yield myself to the Lord. I give glory to God in all that I do. I recognize that all that he has given me, I'm a steward of to manage for him, to give glory to him. All of the money that he has given me, all the time that he has given me, all the talent that he has given to me is, is designed to do one thing, to give glory to God. And as I give glory to God, the prayer is that that mercy is revealed in my life and others may see it who are not a part of the kingdom um, and that may provoke them to jealousy, not jealousy of me, but jealousy of what they don't have and they desire it and they cling to the truth that I'm clinging to as I celebrate the mercy of God and they become saved and are transformed. That's, that's the gospel. And you know, well, how's that happen? I'm going to live my life where I give glory to God. I'm going I'm to be at school. And I'm going to quit saying I'm all alone. And I'm going to get out of the cave and say I'm an Elijah in this school. And I don't care how many Jezebels are here. I'm going to give glory to God and he's going to bless that because all these people are walking under the curse of God and I'm walking under the blessing of God just because I know him. And they can know him too, but they can't know him if I keep hiding in a cave. I come out of the cave, man. That's what the world needs is for us to leave the cave. That's your insight for living as you wonder. What in the world is going on? That's what's going on. It's been going on for ages. And it, it, Jesus will either return in our lifetimes or it'll keep on going on and he will keep writing his story until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. The church is complete. And then that revival will happen among Israel. They were part of that. We have clarity so give glory to God. I'm going to ask you to bow in a spirit of prayer. We're going to have a, a song, a closing song of worship. We do have some people that will pray with you up front. If you have anything that you want to pray about, we got a couple of people that um, we're going to try to implement that they are, they're here to pray with you. You can come up and grab them and, and they'll sit down and talk with you and pray with you about anything you may be struggling with. Maybe you want to like understand the gospel more. Maybe you're just like, man, I don't know what's going on with me right now. I feel like the Lord has just said, I'm supposed to come talk to you. And that will walk you through um, what the Lord may be trying to do in your life. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel. <laughs> so exciting, Lord. I so... What a promise that we just believe. And the more we believe, the more it shapes our behavior. And I'm so encouraged that I don't have to try to behave my way to you. I just believe and I'm in relationship with you. And you will shape me into the person that you want me to be. Thank you, Lord, for the table of blessing. But I'm in fellowship with you. I'm in fellowship with your people. I'm a part of the body of Christ. And I pray for our church. I pray for our church, Lord, in a world that needs to see what it looks like to celebrate mercy. May we be effective at that here in our community. And may you draw your sheep in. And may we see the good soil produce some 30, some 60, some 100. May we see the word continue to increase and spread and the gospel bearing fruit as people comprehend your grace and all its truth. Make it so, Lord. That is our desire, is just to participate in your, your church, your kingdom advancing. We love you, we thank you, and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.